Hello everyone, welcome to our last session of the quarter. Can't believe it's already here. It's, it's felt really long and really short at the same time. I don't know about for you, but um, we've got one last reading to talk about today for our extra credit session here. Uh, and that's this piece um, called Moral Perplexity by a philosopher named Fall, who is not actually that big of a deal of a philosopher. Um, I ran across this article in a meta-ethical reader oh, I don't know, a few years back. I um, just kind of stumbled upon it. I think it's from 1954 or something. So it's it's actually, you know, it's an older article and not not a big, didn't make big splash or something like that. But I, I was like, this is a nice little article. I, I like this um, discussion and it fits in really neatly with um, the conversations we've been having this quarter about realism and anti-realism, relativism, rational optimism, rational fatalism, applied into the scope of moral philosophy and moral disputes. Um, so with all the stuff that we've talked about, especially think back to the uh, Williams-Nagel piece, uh, the end of explanation, um, the, that reading is going to have a lot of um, the kind of conceptual pieces for following what Falk is up to. This kind of plugs right into that discussion. Um, but in a little different way. Um, very very connected, though, with this, these ideas of rational fatalism and rational optimism. Um, so we've got two hours to try to do as much of it as we can. Um, there is a lot of cool stuff going on in the article that we're probably not going to be able to have time for. And in particular, when I've, when I've done this lecture before, um, it seems like we sometimes have to pick and choose about what to cover from what I think of as like the second movement of the article. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a brief outline of, of kind of a summary of what's going on in the whole piece. Um, and then I'll ask you what you might be interested in focusing on. So uh, the first movement is like for all your papers and everything, like setting the stage, identifying what the controversy is, framing it up neatly to see like why, what is the problem here? Why is there a problem? Um, and Falk is going to do something interesting here because he's going to say, you know, there's a, a threat here to the optimism that some people might have for reason being capable of resolving moral dispute and disagreement. I mean, that that's kind of the major problem, right? And sometimes people that are on Falk's side, which are trying to, like, in Nagel's words, like, vindicate rationality um, as being legitimate here, um, may try to minimize the problem or to say the problem is not as bad as you think it is. Falk, interestingly, is like, no, it's that ba it's that bad, and it's it's worse. Right? So Falk does a fantastic job in this first part of the article, just um, emphasizing how uh, this is not a problem to minimize, and he really builds up his opponent as strongly as possible, try to get as deep of a understanding of what we're up against here prior to giving his response. Um, so this is a perfect example of using charity for your opponent, building them up first, not straw manning them, that kind of thing. So that's the whole first part, and we'll talk about that uh, pretty extensively here to begin with. Then there's a second movement where Falk digs more deeply or more detail in a, into a more detailed focus around two particular arguments that support the opponent position. One of them is this argument from Sartre um, about how a reason sort of inability to resolve matters of moral perplexity um, and then this religious argument the the kind of like well we were t we told you so kind of argument if you remember from the reading so that's the one that I'm thinking I'd be interested to hear from everyone in the chat about which of those two you might want to get more uh, more in-depth treatment or explanation from me about or that we have more discussion about I think we might want to do one or the other maybe trying to do both is is uh, we'd only be able to do superficially. If that's what people are really interested in, I'm willing to, to, to make the attempt on that. But I don't, I don't want to short change the third part of the article, which is when Falk actually gives his response, um, where he gives the arguments in defense of, of reason and what he's encouraging for how we should think about reason. And he's going to have two major theses that he's trying to defend, that he's really encouraging uh, as a proposal for what we should think about in terms of the relationship between rationality and moral matters, moral disagreement, moral perplexity. So setting up the problem, sort of looking at two principal arguments from opponents in greater detail, and then Falk's own sort of position and the arguments for it. So... Um, 
Does that make sense? Good little summary there. Any questions about it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No questions? Okay. Just by the way, thank you everyone who's here. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really happy. Uh, you know, I think if we were on campus, if it was a normal quarter, we might have some more people showing up. But uh, you know, I know it's uh, a little harder to do that online, and I'm I'm just tickled that there are nine people here. That's that's fantastic. So I I hope that I'm happy that you're here too, Ali. Um, I hope that you do participate in the chat and jump in and ask questions and stuff. I, I won't have I don't have the ability to look at reading comments ahead of time here, um, so to try to anticipate what you're wondering about or what you want to be talking about. Uh, but don't be shy about about speaking up and, and putting that in there. And then now I'm going to explicitly ask you to vote on um, where where or check in with you about where your interests lie with regard to these two arguments from Falk's opponents, um, the religious argument and the Sartrean argument. Which of those two uh, do people have more interest in that maybe I, we focus on one more than the other? What do we think? Please, please jump in. I want to hear from you. Okay, so Michael, Michael's got to vote for the religious argument. Okay, Ali too. Mm -hmm. And Bernadette, Alar, Christian. Whoa, okay, we got real consensus here. And Anish, all right. Okay. I'll probably, I'll probably touch really briefly on the Sartrean thing, what's going on there, um, but yeah, we can focus more attention on this religious argument. It actually mirrors very closely um, a, a platonic dialogue called the Euthyphro, and what's sometimes referred to as the Euthyphro dilemma, or the, the Euthyphro argument or debate. Um, so we can do that. I'm happy to do that. All right. So, uh, but before we get to that, let's just talk about the setup for the debate. Um, and I'm going to do. I'm going to read some quotes from the reading here. Uh, try to have some connection with the text. Uh, if you've got the reading in front of you, you could pull it up. I'm on the first page here, so just starting right at the beginning. Um, Falk says, and and again, he, I think he wrote this in 1954. Uh, I think that's right, somewhere in that time range. And I remember when I first read this, I was like, man, this. Sound, I was like, really? Is that the date? <laughs> it sounds like it could have been written yesterday. Um, I think uh, this is not outdated by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so he says, every age has its moral perplexities, but our own seems to us to have more than its share. And we might feel that way about our time, too, this many decades later, uh, six, seven decades later. Um, and he says, um, I'm skipping a, a little bit farther ahead here. Um, he says, it is fair to say that there is less agreement and more uncertainty about moral matters today than, let us say, in the late 19th century. Uh, there's more dispute about rights and duties of parents, of children, of husbands, of wives, of individuals in the state. There's a rejection of ready-made rules and generally an air of unsettlement. And I, in some ways, you know, I think he's trying to emphasize that every age does have its moral perplexities. And 19th century, I mean, to just pick that out uh, historically, had plenty of them itself. Um, and but there, there are differences, you know, the times are not always exactly the same. And while there are might, there might be some things that are universal, there are always some things that are contingent too. And keeping track of both of those things is sometimes something that takes some, um, I'd say, philosophical maybe maturity or, or uh, discipline to like keep, keep, make sure we're tracking both things. Um, sometimes the emphasis on the contingencies is used to reject the universals. Sometimes the emphasis on the, re on the universals means to reject the unique complexities of the contingencies. Um, I think Falk is trying to have a balanced perspective of both here. Um, but then he says, you know, that's one thing, right? There are, there are these um, moral perplexities that we face. Uh, but there's something else too, he says. A sense of uneasiness about the fact that we are so divided and unsure. We are used to believing that there's a right and wrong about choices and ways of life, and that right thinking, here as elsewhere, can, dispel, can discern truth and dispel error. 
So that's like rational optimism, that we can apply the tools of rationality to solve these problems. And one of the reasons why I think he mentions the 19th century is that this is coming on the tail end of the Enlightenment, in which there was incredible optimism among Western philosophers for reason and reason's ability to solve problems. I mean, that's what sort of characterizes the early modern period. It's like people, this is when the scientific revolution is happening. This is when all these like progressive political and social reforms are happening. There's this huge emphasis on social justice and resolving cross-cultural disagreement through appeal to universal principles. Um, things like fundamental human rights is what emerges in this time. The, re the rejection and condemnation of slavery, um, democracies rise, like all these things are um, connected with this optimism about reason and reason's power, Falk says. But now there are not a few who feel that this view is on, itself is on trial, the rational optimism. What is added to our moral perplexities is perplexity about morals. People put this by saying that there is some radical error in the traditional view that reason can solve moral issues. According to some, that reason can solve them at all, that's going to be the Sartrean view. According to others, that it can solve them unaided by religion, that's going to be the religious argument. There was a time when Immanuel Kant could speak of the two great certainties, this is a famous quote from him, the starry heavens above us and the moral law known by pure reason within us. In our time, both of these seem to be fading into the nebulae. So he's saying, uh, you know, Kant, Kant, this is a reference to Kant here, is that um, there are uh, laws, <laughs> like natural laws, about how reality is, um, and those are things that we are able to gain epistemic access to, albeit in this, you know, for Kant, we talked, we got a little sneak preview about this um, in a sort of weirder sort of way than our, we might intuitively think about our ability to gain knowledge about reality, but that there are, there is this, if you remember from the Kant lecture, there's no way for us to avoid thinking about reality in terms of there being causal laws that give structure to it and explain why things happen the way that they do. This is how our experience becomes intelligible to us. But the other half of it, the part you have not, we didn't talk about so much, is Kant's moral theory, which is very parallel to his uh, metaphysical and, and epistemic theory about perception, experience, and knowledge of the world. Um, that basically the moral law is baked in to our capacity, capacities as rational agents. And when we are deciding what to do, when we're trying to like write our own programming to give ourselves principles for action, we're constrained not by some external moral authority that's demanding us to obey it or something like that, but Kant tries to derive the objectivity of the moral law from just the constitutive aspects of our capacities to be self-determining, to make decisions about what to value and how we're going to act. That, and he basically tries to derive it from rules of pure logic. He says, pure reason, known by pure reason. For Kant, pure is a technical term that means not contingent, that it's formal and necessary. So remember before from Kant, I, I don't get on too much of a Kant lecture here, but Kant is, is, an, is an instructive example of what confidence and reason can look like for moral perplexity. Like he's a, a really good example of the traditional view here. Do you remember when we were doing that whole picture of Kant's architecture for the mechanics of the mind, how the mind functions in experience, and that there were these necessary rational presuppositions that made any experience or judgment possible? Things like the principle of uniformity of nature, the idea that every event has a cause and has an effect, and this is that this happens according to some kind of determined rules. The thesis of determinism is actually something Kant thinks is baked into our ability to experience anything or think about anything, to make it thinkable. So reason is imposing some necessary form on experience. Well, that's for judgments of existence. Kant thinks the same thing happens when we're making judgments about what is good or what we ought to do. The first version, the stuff that you might be familiar with from the lecture we had weeks ago, is what Kant calls theoretical reason, a functioning of reason that's a matter of trying to make sense of experience in life and render it intelligible. The second function he calls practical reason, and it's how reason designs 
rules for how we're going to operate, where we get to write our own programming, that our actions are not just determined by causality, like our psychology or issues of sociology or that kind of thing. Um, we're not just conditioned creatures. We, we do have aspects like that, like the way our brains are wired and influences how things go for us, right? But we're not just robots. We have some programming that's sort of baked in, you know, naturalistically, but we also have this power through reason to make judgments about it and to write our own programming. So even if I, my psychology is making me feel certain things or having impulses or motives or desires, that I have the ability to self-reflect and be like, do I approve of that? Do I think that this is a good thing? Do I want to give authority to my feelings in this case, or do I think that they're illegitimate or objectionable, and maybe I'm going to resist them? It's, it's like impulse control. You can have this to various degrees, but you can decide there, there's space available for um, thinking about how I'm going to orient or frame or understand what I'm experiencing and feeling. I can have an impulse that jumps into my head, and I'm like, I really want to yell at this person right now. Well, oh, well, maybe maybe that's not the best thing to do. Like I can stop myself before I wreck myself. And it's the capacity of reason in us that Kant thinks gives us access to this space of ethics and morality. And while our ability to execute on it um, and be fully rational in terms of deciding what to do is maybe something that we never are able to do perfectly. Kant's actually really skeptical that you can ever tell <laughs> that this is happening. The main point that it's just possible that we have access to this space is a major thing in and of itself. And then Kant breaks down how what, what are the formal requirements of reason exerting itself in this practical functioning. And then he gets his famous categorical imperative. And to make a really, really long story short here, if, you, if you're if you really curious about this, I highly recommend taking Philosophy 102, the Contemporary Moral Problems, uh, get a very deep dive into that, take an ethics class and study Kant. It's really fascinating as a theory. Uh, it's definitely the, the theoretical foundations for human rights ethics today. Um, but the, the, the sort of the punchline to Kant's whole ethics is his third formulation of the categorical imperative, where based on principles of pure logic, he's able to squeeze out, I always describe this to my students as squeezing blood from a stone, that he is able to derive this idea that you, ha of necessity, it is a moral law that you have to, when you're acting with other people, with respect to other people and to yourself, that you have to always respect everybody necessarily as intrinsically valuable, as an end in themselves, and that you can't, it's always wrong, no excuses, no exception cases, it's always wrong to treat another person as a tool or as a means for some other end. Um, so slavery is like the perfect example of this, of treating a person as a tool for some other end, instead of respecting them as having the dignity of existing as a thing that is capable of being an end in itself aka having intrinsic value. And this is where you get the idea of fundamental human rights, that um, we need to respect rights as a way of respecting people and treating them as intrinsically valuable. You can't throw people under the bus or just treat them as a commodity or a resource for other purposes. And we do this all the time in big ways like slavery and in small ways like um, manipulating your friends for receiving some benefit from them. Um, even if it's just sort of like an emotional payoff, like you could you could disrespect your friend by using them as just a source f to bolster your own ego or something like that, and that you don't care about them for their own sake, but you just see them as a tool to receive something else um, that, or to pursue some other goal. And Kant even is unwilling to uh, accept using people as tools for even altruistic purposes, like maximizing people's well-being or happiness that even if there's some beneficent end for what you why you'd want to manipulate or use people in this way can't do it always wrong um did i talk about this before does this ring some bells i'm having some deja vu like we i maybe had talked a little bit about Kant's ethics as a part of some other conversation we had is this Am I rehashing some stuff? You don't remember? Okay, okay, okay. I might just be getting my wires crossed. All right, so so Kant, Kant's an example of this kind of traditional view um, 
about reason having this ability to kind of like, at least in principle, adjudicate all of these moral matters, regardless of cultural background or anything like that. Um, so, uh, um, so yeah, uh, that's that's kind of the traditional view. And then Falk is saying this view is on trial. Um, so. At later, he's gonna. Well, no, I don't want to skip ahead here. Okay, okay. Let's uh, let's uh, let's move here next. Um, so, one of the major arguments that gets offered uh, for defending a view like, say, moral relativism, that there aren't objective universal truths about what's morally good and bad and right and wrong, um, is this argument from disagreement. That well, the fact that everyone we've got all this diversity of opinion shows that reason doesn't solve all these things. And that when we've been trying at this for so long, like we've had thousands of years to debate moral philosophy, like, and it isn't a recent thing that p humans have been concerned about what is really just. It's right there at the dawn of philosophy. There, um, ethics has been a core part of it. In fact, for some philosophers, like Plato in particular, that's the whole game. Like, Plato thinks ethics is where everything begins. If you remember back to the beginning of the quarter, you know, he talks about the forms and, and the highest form, the, the final truth that all of our reflective efforts aim at is the form of the good, of justice. Like, that's what it's all about. And I, I would say in a more detailed way here, looking at Plato's philosophy, you can see, even when the topic is not ethics, that an ethical lens is being put onto what are we doing here in philosophy and trying to answer this question. So um, this is not a new thing. We've been working on it. And after centuries and millennia working on it, we haven't really gotten any closer to resolving it. We got all the same disagreements we had before. Like the kinds of ethical de debates that happen in the ancient world uh, are still reflected in disagreements today. Um, so maybe, maybe the problem is not uh, it? Maybe the problem is with reason itself. Right? Reason's had its shot. It wasn't able to solve the problems. So maybe we should give up on it and stop expecting that we're gonna, you know, keep that we're gonna get something productive out of that. It's a false hope. That's part of the concern here. Um, that that these uh, yeah. So that we've we've had our shot at it and it hasn't worked. Um, one thing I've heard is like a modern version of this kind of line of reasoning is that if you compare ethics against something like science, science has been way more productive. Russell kind of talked about this a little bit, about in the value of philosophy, although you could apply what he's saying about philosophy to ethics in particular, of an asymmetry here, that we've been working on scientific problems, and yeah, we still have a lot of work to do, but it's pretty clear there's been progress on this. We're getting closer to the truth. We're making, you know, we're making strides. But in morality, we're talking about the same basic shit, the same fundamental assumptions that we've been kicking around from the beginning, and so it doesn't seem like it's moved as productively as it has at that science. So maybe the answer is that's because there isn't a truth. There's no truth there to to be like correcting our view of or something like that. So this argument is very common. Um, with me so far, any questions popping up so far? It's all intelligible. Okay, okay, all right. So then Falk kind of flips on the other side here. And he's like, okay, so there, you know, we've got the traditional view, problematize a little bit, people got these concerns, skeptical concerns. Then there might be another person who's like, oh, come on, this isn't that big of a deal. All right, so he says, such views are a measure of some people's bewilderment, but they need not be correct as a diagnosis. And one may look at the situation more soberly, because one may say, there is, after all, no more to the moral condition of our time than could be expected from its character generally. Ours is a time which requires adaptation to big changes all around. What were sound practices of public finance yesterday are so no longer today. Sound familiar? Uh, why should the same not apply to what used to be sound moral practices? The world's changing, so the moral problems are going to change too. Moral codes are rules of thumb for the advancement of individual and social welfare, and as they have been learned, they may have to be unlearned. Times have changed. Consider our views on relations between men and women. At a time when women, and this is in 1954, right? Um, this, this is still the general dynamic. The, the needles moved, but the general dynamic is still present. 
At a time when women have careers, when technology changes the economics of the household, medical science, the care of the body, psychology, our knowledge of mental hygiene, some traditional rules may, must lose their point, and new ways have to be evolved. This may not be easy and uncontroversial, but it involves none but practical problems. There is no need for taking the birth pangs of adaptation for the crack of doom. Okay, um, So he says, one may have different views on the causes of our perplexities. So the, the, the rational fatalist view is like reasons the problem for why we're not making progress on resolving disagreement. The other person here, the, maybe the rational optimist, is like, hey, you don't need to be freaking out about this. We just have new problems to face. And reason was able to give us an access point for solving problems in the past, but now we've got different problems. We're faced with new questions. The world that we have to ethically navigate is different, so of course there's going to still be struggle. Don't freak out, right? Stay calm and carry on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and Falk is sort of positioned not on one side or the other of this. He's kind of opposed to both. And uh, we're, we'll talk about the skeptical view a little bit more here, with, especially the religious argument in Sartre in a second, but on the side that you don't need to be freaking out, Falk is, you know, that's going to be closer to Falk's final position because he's a rational optimist and he wants to vindicate reason in this article and say there's no, there's no good cause here for losing, um, for detaching from our commitment to exploring moral disagreement through rational means. But he doesn't take the more lightheaded view of this that, that this other kind of side of the debate that he's framing up seems to take. And I want to skip ahead here into uh, the second page here because there's a there's a little um, sort of uh, toy example of this perspective that um, that uh, Falk is looking to problematize a little bit to say it's actually kind of worse. It's not that simple. So here's the um, here's the the sort of toy opponent on this other end. People have said there's one ultimate end on which agreement can be presupposed. And this is, this is coming from a contemporary philosopher of Falk's time. That above all, we ought to do the most good and the least harm all around, all things considered. And all moral disputes are simply as the best means to that end. But everyone is basically saying there isn't all this moral disagreement. <clears throat> There's actually an incredible amount of consensus. Everyone agrees that morality is a matter of doing the most good and the least harm. And if you disagree about it, the only reason why we disagree is that we have different ideas about just how to pursue that. And what's going to solve those problems? Science. Or the principal equivalent. That all we need to do is learn more about how the world works to be able to pick out the best means for accomplishing that end. But there isn't really a whole, there's not this like deep-seated, this, this perspective is saying, there isn't this deep-seated moral disagreement that's going to make it impossible for us to make any progress on this. Okay. Sorry, one second. <laughs> oh, those allergies are getting to me. Hmm. All these beautiful flowers blooming in my um, apartment. Thank you. Ooh. Hmm. Oh, sinuses are tingling. All right. Okay. And so Falk says, unfortunately, this is too sweeping. And it's too sweeping because not all moral disputes arise from disagreement about the best means toward agreed ends. And what he then goes on to do, sort of unfold all of the opportunities for moral disagreement that are there. And that this diagnosis is way too simple. Um, I really like his example here where... He's talking about parenting. And this is maybe one of the more plausible examples of what this optimistic opponent that Falk is also kind of against their view as much as to the rational fatalist or skeptic here, that he's sort of in this middle position. When he's talking, to, this would be something more sympathetic to them, that parents generally, not always, unfortunately, it's a deep tragedy, but parents generally, let's be charitable toward them, want to... Um, do what's best for their kids. They want their kids to be raised in a in a way that um, gives them the best chance for success, where they can be happy, they can be empowered, they can be moral, 
all these sorts of things. But parents get into deep disagreements about what proper parenting ought to look like. But the disagreement is really just about understanding what technique of parenting is going to get that good outcome of doing what's best for their child. Um, say the, the, the whether, you know, how strict should the parenting be? Should you, you know, the heard the terrible adage, in my opinion, um, spare the rod and spoil the child, which is like a defense of corporal punishment, like physical violence as a, as a parenting technique, or to, or, you know, that view or the one that says, no, you shouldn't be parenting this way, that that's, that's not the best way to parent the child. I mean, that whether one is the view or the other might just come down to doing some more developmental psychology or studying the effects of one parenting technique versus another. What does it cause? What does it not cause? And it's the, it's the empirical ambiguity that leads to people making different decisions. Like, imagine the person who, the parent who thinks that um, corporal punishment is the right way to go. If they were able to see the irrefutable evidence, they accept the evidence, we're not imagining some kind of irrationality or, or dogmatic closed-mindedness on their part. If they had the evidence that clearly shows corporal punishment is going to create m mental trauma and mental illness for their child, they're probably not gonna do it anymore. Right? It'd be like, this is the wrong thing to do. And if they don't, then it's just their their failure to be responsive to the rational considerations. We wouldn't say, oh, reason had the problem here. Reason sorted it out for us. You know, we're like, there's the clear evidence for why that's not the way to go. That's not helpful. It's creating harm and not creating benefit. So there, there's the moral disagreement resolved, right? But Falk wants to say it is more complicated than just this. We can't reduce all moral disagreements to just disagreements about means that come down to our ignorance about the empirical causal structure of reality. I've heard contemporary philosophers offer this kind of thing. Um, I, I hesitate to even bring up his name as if he's like a philosopher in the league of all these other philosophers. Um, so give my some personal opinion here. But maybe you've heard of Sam Harris before. And whenever listen to Sam Harris or read something from him. He's kind of like a public intellectual. Um, <clears throat> not heard of him? I've heard of him. Okay, yeah. Sam, Sam Harris is an example of someone who sort of takes this view that he's like, morality is not complicated here and if you just have the right scientific information that solves everything. Um, it's a very, he's, he tries to give it what's called naturalized account of normativity. A naturalistic ethic um, and <clears throat> Falk would definitely if he was alive today um, be like nope to Sam Harris just as an example here all right so what are all these things so you mentioned this toy opponent here of the person who thinks there's one ultimate end on which agreement can be presupposed to do the most good and the least harm um, and everything else is just a matter of the means okay so what Falk's going to do to problematize it is say, okay, well, let's just imagine consensus on that. Let's just grant that for the sake of argument. What else is there to possibly disagree about? And there's a lot. First, we'd have to figure out what is on the good list, what's benefit, and what's on the harm list. What are the pros and the cons? What is, what is harmful and what is beneficial? We could disagree about that, and we do disagree about that. We disagree about whether something is a good thing or a bad thing, whether it should count on one side of that equation or the other. So that's one area of disagreement. We could even imagine agreement there, <clears throat> but imagine disagreement on once you, so imagine you and I have the same list of what co constitutes harm and benefit. We could disagree about which one should take higher priority than the other. When push comes to shove and you have to choose between these two bad things, which one do you think weighs for more than the other? Or if you have to choose between two good things, which thing is going to weigh for more than the other? What's more important? If Falk talks about things like freedom or security, or freedom and well-being, where is that trade-off going to go? How important is freedom compared to well-being and happiness? We think both of them are good, but which ones are the highest? What which takes the highest priority? This is, in my opinion, as an ethicist probably where most of the disagreement happens. Um, most ethical theories differ from each other, not in terms of what they think are good and bad, 
but which things take the most importance, which things are the ends to which the other things are valuable as a way of promoting. Like, do you put uh, justice at the top or do you put well-being, right? So or like freedom and autonomy issues, just as an example here, and then well-being or happiness is in service of this or secondary, or do you flip that priority around? The, the, a lot of debates in social justice are about one of those priority structures over the other. Um, so that's that's a massive place of disagreement. Um, when I teach ethical theories in, say, my 102 class, um, when it comes down to like particular behavior, the theories oftentimes converge a lot. Where they're like, everyone's going to say don't murder people, rape is bad, like promote happiness. Everyone kind of agrees on these things, but why they think they're right is really crucial because that's going to change if you have to choose between them which way you're going to choose. Um, uh, and that that's where a lot of a lot of the disagreement happens. So <clears throat> priorities can be different. Um, I also really like Falk's introduction of this wrinkle of where he puts it as um, you have to figure out how to distribute your good terms. So even if we agreed what gets on the good list, what what's beneficial, what's harmful, and we agreed about the priority rankings of these things, both within those lists and compared to each other, right? If you have to choose between avoiding a harm and receiving a benefit, you know, which of those takes priority? Even if we agreed to all that, we have limited resources. You only have so much time and energy and opportunity in your life in this world. How should you be carving it up? Um, I personally really feel this in our in the circumstances of our world today, um, especially being an ethicist too. It's like if you're paying attention, there are so many different places or arenas where there is moral need, where there are in unjust things happening um, or people suffering on so many different dimensions and levels. It can get really overwhelming. There are so many issues that you could imagine devoting your entire life to trying to deal with that moral tragedy and that being like a great way to spend your life. But then you're like, but there's all these other ones too, right? And I think a lot of what happens in discussions today is people have sort of, I don't want to be too demeaning here, but like pet moral projects or sensitivities. There's things that they're aware of because maybe of their more personal circumstances or what life has exposed them to. And then that gets the attention because it's such a big effing moral deal to the neglect of all these other issues that are happening at the same time. And trying to balance that all out, that's really, really tough. And we could disagree about how to do that. We could agree with all the measuring sticks here and disagree about how to apply them in devoting our energies and resources. Like uh, he talks about, um, you know, here's a direct quote. Few parents will dispute that their children's good is their concern, like their responsibility. They have obligations to their children. But how much so is already another matter. Um, it may be true that infinite patience will rear children free of hate and aggression, but to do so to perfection may also consume the time and energy of their parents. How much of their own lives, then, should parents make over to their children? This is no longer a question of means to ends. It is quite a different sort of question, one of deciding between legitimate and conflicting ends of how to distribute one's good terms. So that's a whole other thing of disagreement. And then we return to the original premise of that the ultimate moral principle is do the most good and least harm and say, even that can be disputed. And it can. And I highly recommend studying ethical theory to see like how deep that kind of like fundamental assumptions of morality, how deep those discussions can go. And the disagreements about how we'd even sort it out. What way of using reason is the one that confers legitimacy to some of these perspectives over the others? So there's a lot of disagreement to be had. All right, I want to give you um, the first half of your skeleton key for the C-O-D-E, and that is going to be trans, and I'll type it in here. So that's half, and you're going to get the other half in a second. This is coming from a, a board game I received in the mail yesterday I'm very excited about uh, that I won't be able to play until maybe next week. <laughs> but it's by a designer who likes to do really ambitious sort of philosophical things with board game design, um, but this is half of the name of the game. So you'll get the other half in a little bit. Um, let's take a short break uh, for like 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and have the second half of our lecture. And see if you got any like questions that have been coming up in the lecture so far, and we're not going to answer them a little bit. Okay, see you in a little bit.
All right, I'm back, everyone. Everyone here? Cool. I, oh, I'm gonna um, just get some more water. It'll, be, it'll just take me a second. Okay, so any questions pop up over the break from, from the first half of the lecture today? You doing okay? Yeah, okay. Cool. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the second movement of the article with these two more specific arguments that challenge the sort of authority or confidence in reason to be able to resolve problems, uh, moral moral perplexities. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to touch on the Sartre thing a, a little bit, and then we'll, we'll dig into the religious argument a little bit more. Sartre has this famous case of uh, a student who came to him looking for advice. He wanted, he wanted starts like a philosopher, you know, he's going to have some insight about what's the ethical thing to do. And his student is trying to choose between um, joining the free French resistance against the Nazis, like the Nazis are occupying France, um, so fighting against, the, against fascism and, uh, and the injustice that the Nazis are up to, um, or staying home, not joining the resistance, and taking care of, I think, his mother or something, his widowed mother, whose life depended on him. Okay, so uh, if he joins the Free French Resistance, then his mother has no one to take care of him, of her, right? Um, but if he stays home, then he's not contributing to this other big problem. So he's like, what should I do? And Sartre's like, tough break, got to make a decision. And student, it's like, doesn't help, right? <laughs> doesn't students looking for some insight about this of like, what what's the right thing to do? Like, how should I make this decision? On what basis should I make the decision? And starts like, yep, yeah, nothing you can do about that. Um, reason's not going to solve your question for you. And there is a kind of big, bigger backstory here to what Sart is thinking about. Um, just to go back to Kantian ethics really quickly for just a second, um, Kant talks about how uh, to to act morally, one has to uh, act from rational principles, from intention. Um, and not that, you, you basically, to be free requires being self-determining. That if you're just, like, acting on your impulses or desires or emotions, it's not really you who's in direction of your own will. Uh, it's the laws of nature, of your psychology, that are determining your action. It, it's not, it's not uh, self-generated. This is a, con, d, contrasts self-generated action that's done. The reason gives us the power to design these principles to write our own programming, or what he calls laws of inclination, which are all this causal stuff that, and we're subject to both. Our wills are influenced by both. We can, we do have some kind of capacity for this kind of free will to make decisions to reason, um, but we also, our wills are subject to bias and and all these other influencing motives. Okay, and like I said earlier, like Kant, it's like it's hard to tell which is which. You can't. This isn't black and white. Um, they can mix with each other too. Like inclinations can subvert your rational, reflective efforts of being self-determining too. 
But Sartre takes that theme and runs even further with it and says the same, like the way Kant would say, acting on your desires is basically you giving up your freedom and having taking your hands off the wheel and being like, psychology, you, you figured this out, not me. Right? Um, there's a much deeper story here about Kant's moral psychology and you might have some questions about like or early objections to this basic program that Kant anticipates and he's got some resources to do. So I'm not going to open up that whole can of worms. But the main framework here is that Sartre thinks that any, anything that you use as a basis for your decision is actually you giving up freedom. You're abandoning in what he calls bad faith. Um, the decision that is ultimately up to you to just make arbitrarily. Sartre thinks there is nothing that will decide your decisions for you. Not your inclinations or desires or the stuff Kant was thinking about, but also not pure reason, not pure logic all on its own. So he disagrees with Kant's derivation of a categorical moral law, necessary moral law on the basis of pure logic. It can't be authorities like external authorities like the government or society or culture that you live in it can't be god it can't be your parents or anything like that none of it is really capable of authorizing the choice or making the choice for you and you're operating in bad faith sartre thinks if you are finding ways to negotiate out of a reflection of what's actually the real reality here which is that you just have to make the call. You just have to choose something, and that's real freedom. Arbitrary action for Sartre is real freedom. Um, and so that's this kind of anti-rationalist or, or uh, rationally sort of fatalistic implication of Sartre's view. Okay, so um, there's Sartre's against giving, giving away your choice to something else to make the choice for you. That's how I could like summarize it as a slogan. Okay. So uh, Sartre thinks that these really difficult choices, these cases of moral perplexity, like the case of his student, sort of reveal how this is what is going on. And it's always going on, really, he thinks, um, but we just might not notice it because we're presupposing things. We're taking things for granted um, about the choices that we have, in fact, made, that everything is a choice. Um, and we just may be trying to lie to ourselves about it uh, or rationalize it in some other way, which is why he calls doing this sort of thing operating under bad faith. This is a, Sartre is an existentialist, so he's thinking about the sort of fundamental character of what it is to exist and be a person in reality. And he thinks that what it ultimately is, is pure freedom, un restrained in any sort of way whatsoever and it's ultimately arbitrary it's not principled for Kant being free being self-determining is a matter of subjecting your will to rational rules and for Sartre it's that no you're just making arbitrary choices okay so that's a little bit of, of the Sartre stuff and, and I know we're, we're not we didn't we're, we didn't choose to focus on it, so I'm gonna I just want to touch on it really briefly but let's get into the second argument okay and I, I'm gonna get back to the text here um, so he says, we, we need not follow Sartre all the way, as we shall see in a moment. So he's going to give a reply to Sartre's argument in the third section. But even so, it becomes clear that right choices of ultimate ends may often have no sure guide in reason. Reason's not capable of resolving these problems. And not everyone will, like Sartre, accept this with stoic pride as the cross of human freedom, that you just have to make these arbitrary decisions. So it is um, not surprising that the present should show one more trend. The trust in reason as a guide to conduct has hi historically succeeded the view that reason in morals requires the backing of religion. The emancipation of morality from religion on the contemporary scale is the product of recent history. This is very connected with the, the Enlightenment, too, although this is not a black and white issue either because most of the Enlightenment thinkers and philosophers were also religious and didn't see a conflict here. Um, uh, and now with the limits of reason having become more apparent, there are also voices which cry, we told you so. That reason fails us does not mean, for this view, that there is no right or wrong for human choices. It's not, it's not the Sartrean view that it's all arbitrary. Um, but just that it shows that we have forgotten to look for instruction in the right place. The true lesson of the present and all this pessimism about reason's inability to resolve moral perplexity 
is that we must go back on the divorce of morals from religion. Okay, so the, the basic idea here is that if we, through skeptical philosophical reflection, recognize that reason's not up to the task here, that doesn't mean there aren't answers about objective morality. It's just that you can't put your eggs in the basket of human reason to resolve it. This is, we're finite and fallible creatures, and so we're not capable of, of having the wisdom on these objective moral matters, and that's why you need God, or you need religion, or something like that. Okay, so this is this is the argument. This is another one of of the opponents that Falk wants to go after here. Um, I really want to emphasize going into this that uh, something that's going to emerge at the end, which is that Falk is not opposed to any kind of religious contribution to questions of morality. Um, the point here is not that religion is. Uh, completely inept at being able to to make a contribution here, as as we'll see. But rather that this is speaking to a very particular type of understanding um, religious ethics uh, or a religious view on morals. So not everyone who is religious subscribes to the view that we're talking about with this opponent. Um, but this is one possible option. Uh, and if you just are looking for an example of that, uh, you don't need to go much further than me. <laughs> so I would fit in this camp of, of someone who is religious, but also would not subscribe to the view that is this opponent position that Falk is going after. Um, we could uh, technically define this view as something called divine command theory. Divine command theory says that it's God's commands that make for the moral truths. Okay. So um, that uh, by God telling us to do something, that it therefore means that is what you ought to do. Um, this is divine command theory. Um, at least the, the first version, the first horn of the dilemma, would, that, that position would, would be the way to understand it. And there are other ways of understanding a, a religious account of morality that don't require divine command theory to do so. Uh, but we'll, we'll see that. I just want to, this is some foreshadowing. I'm going to explain this all more in a second. But um, I wanted to indicate that, that subtlety that's very important. We're not throwing every religious philosophy or religiously inspired or informed philosophy in the same boat here. There's, there's options. There's some diversity here. But there's one particular version, and that's the version that Falk is dealing with. So does that subtlety make sense, even at this early stage here before I've explained more? Yeah? Okay. Cool. Thank you for the feedback. Okay, so um, I just heard from one person, but <laughs> I hope that's going okay. Does anyone have any questions about what I've been saying so far? Doing all right? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I mentioned that this is connected with a dilemma that comes from a platonic dialogue called the Euthyphro. And the, the setting for the Euthyphro is Socrates is actually on his way to the trial that ultimately results in his uh, death penalty, in the death penalty judgment being handed down to him. But on his way to this, he uh, runs across um, this uh, young person of Athens who's about to bring his own father into court uh, to charge his own father with... Um, lack of piety to the gods, like basically religious taboo kind of thing, which is exactly the charge that Socrates is about to be leveraged with himself. So there's some, there's some dramatic uh, irony going on here with this, this, this discussion that happens between Socrates and Euthyphro. But the, the way that the conversation turns, the like main, major philosophical question that uh, is posed is, do the gods love what is good because it is good? Or is it good because the gods love it? And I'm, I'm using the plural here because we're talking ancient Athens uh, with a, a polytheistic religious framework here. But the, the monotheistic version is going to, a lot of the stuff is going to apply mutatis mutandis to mo the monotheistic context. And that little Latin phrase just means like in the same way. It's good, they're going to be analogous. They're going to be parallel here. Um, but the, the question is, what, which, if we think that there's a connection between what's up with God or the gods and what is morally good, how is that connection to be handled? And one option is to say, well, it's because the gods love it or that God commands it that it is good or it is moral. 
and that's divine command theory. The, the, um, to put this in a broader theological context, um, the way you might say God creates truth in the descriptive world by being the creator of everything. So why are the laws of nature that science studies the way that they are? Well, because God made them that way. So God could have made them a different way, but he chose to do it this way, and so that's the truth of reality. So this is, this is uh, God as the omnipotent thing, the creator, uh, the person who makes reality. Okay? So then you might think, well, if you're assuming all this is a premise, um, if God has the power to set the descriptive facts of reality, maybe God also has the power, through his omnipotence, to set the moral facts of reality. And the way that this happens is through the commands that God gives. So God has it within his power, based on what he values, or she, or whatever <laughs> pronoun we want to use here, whatever God values determines what is valuable and what ought to be valued. So if God says don't kill people, killing people's wrong. Right? But if God had said something different, then that's what would have been right. And there's no higher court of appeal for authority in determining moral truth than whatever God says. That's what the divine command theorist commits to. So that's one option of how we can see a connection here. The other option is to say, well, the gods love this thing because it is good, which implies that that goodness is set independently of what the gods have going on sort of subjectively. Or the same thing could be said with the, in the monotheistic context here, that the reason why God commands what God commands, like say Ten Commandments or something, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, blah, 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 uh, is because those are the things that are actually good. And because God is good and omniscient, God is a good epistemic guide for morality. So God's capable of giving us the moral insight that we couldn't arrive at through our own means or that we're going to screw up with our fallibility or our imperfect human reason, right? Um, God's a trustworthy authority on this, so you should do what he says. Um, but it, it's not God's power to create the moral truth that's being emphasized here. It's God's position of knowing about it and being trustworthy in informing us about it. So trust to God's commands rather than to your own judgment is what the is how even that angle would work for this argument okay so in terms of the this religious argument against rational optimism don't put your eggs in this basket kind of thing right Anish asks are all religions based on divine command theory so that's what I was trying to emphasize earlier no <laughs> it doesn't have to work that way it can work like the second way the second way is not divine command theory uh, divine command theory is saying God has the power to create the moral facts, whereas the second option of saying he's just a reliable indicator of them is emphasizing God's role as a sort of epistemic access point for moral truth, but not that God creates it. So to see the contrast here, imagine just a hypothetical, uh, just as a thought experiment. What if God said something like, yeah, um, rape is wrong, don't do it, except on the second Tuesday of the month, in which case it's totally fine. What if that had been one of the Ten Commandments? It wasn't, but what if it had been? Uh, well, the first version of divine command theory would say, well, then that's what's right. They just bite the bullet on that. The second version would say, well, if that's what God's commanding, well, that's maybe objectively wrong. And so God is not a reliable indicator of moral truth in that case, right? It depends on whether what God is recommending actually accords with what is truly morally just, right? That's what it would come down to. Does this distinction make any sense? You see in the contrast between these two approaches? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. That's good, good to know. Okay. So now we've got the two options here sort of framed up. Um, what does Falk want to say about these? Well, in the Euthyphro, in the Platonic dialogue, they reject the first option in favor of the second, that the first one just becomes unintelligible. Um, here's what Falk says about this. Um, do, 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 uh, all I want to say is that, in my opinion, this solution would be no cure-all, the just deference to God's authority as being able to create the moral facts. Because morality, as we understand it, is logically independent of religious authority. And if the skeptics were right, and there was no better or worse in ultimate choices discernible by reason, then religious authority couldn't mend things either. 
Because how could any authority, and this is the big argument here, how could any authority settle that well-doing is the right and harm-doing the wrong choice for a human being? One may say, but if God says so, surely this should settle it. And in a way, this is fair enough for believers at any rate. But we must be clear about the sense in which this is to be taken. For some people will mean by this, God settles the matter by saying so, by commanding us to choose in this way, divine command theory. But this would not be to settle the manner in the required way. It might make people do good or avoid harm in obedience to an order, but it could not produce the conviction that this choice was a morally right one, or to produce actions which could be called moral because they flowed from this conviction. Because one understands by a morally right choice one which is justified purely on the merits of the case, and one which makes uh, one makes independently of anyone say so. Okay, so what he's basically saying is that morality by its very nature isn't subject to anyone's command whether it's mine or God's or anything right one understands by moral conduct conduct which is quite unforced from without coming purely from the inner conviction that the action is right for one in itself God's command as such therefore could not do even if God is right about this uh, could not do in place of a rational conviction of right or wrong so the deference to authority here can't replace the role that reason has to play. That's that's the ma a major point that um, Falk is trying to make here. Um, morality as we understand it still stands or falls on the possibility of arriving at such a conviction independently of any authority. So um, I could also extrapolate this a little bit in terms of imagining um, just bullying, right? So let's say humans are doing this to each other, that they're bullying each other into right conduct through requiring total obedience like maybe you can imagine draconian parents doing this with their children um, <clears throat> just saying this is what's right to do because I said so that's it I'm the authority on this and we might say intuitively yeah this isn't going to produce any kind of authentic moral commitment or conviction that even if the obedience happens it's not a moral action that it takes place and especially if it's linked with something like promise of punishment or reward based on the obedience or disobedience, um, that's not going to get sincere moral concern going either. And there are some ways that I've seen some theological pictures, and I'm speaking to someone who's religious here, that sort of make God into a cosmic bully. That he's like extorting obedience out of humans by threatening them with hell or promising them heaven, something like that. That doesn't seem consistent with a moral person, right, of God as, a, as, a, as someone who has sincere um, commitment to uh, a moral perspective. Uh, this would, it doesn't fly with us, it wouldn't fly with God either. All right, so this is, this is one side of the dilemma. Um, and that one is, is kind of the, I think, the easier one to defeat here. Um, the, the Euthyphro, argue, I recommend checking out the Euthyphro, it's a fantastic platonic dialogue. You can see some more in-depth versions of the arguments there, but I mean, there's a kind of absurdity just in the idea that if God had just commanded something else, like my silly example of rape is permissible on the second Tuesday of every month, um, they'd be like, just because God commanded that wouldn't make it right. It seems so against every way in which we think of what morality is in principle, even if we're unsure which things are right and which things are wrong, that this isn't fitting the bill. This isn't meeting the conditions for what any moral truth, how it's supposed to operate. Um, is this making sense so far, people in chat? The response to the first horn of the dilemma? Yeah, okay. Any questions? Oh, wonderful. Nice. All right, so here's the second half, which is far more plausible. Like I said in the Euthyphro dialogue, the second one is the one that they kind of basically go with, that God com or the gods love this thing because it is good, or God commands these things because they are right. So this doesn't call, it, this isn't presenting God like a bully, but it's more like a moral friend, like someone who's just trying to encourage you to do what's right. They've got the right view of it. It doesn't involve any distrust of uh, God's goodness or God's position to understand what is moral, um, but sort of still saying that 
um, on those grounds, you should defer to God's judgment instead of doing any kind of independent critical thinking or reasoning or reflection on your own. Um, to trust the God's judgment over your own judgment is still something that can happen under the second path. Okay, So I, I think there's a, a lot of religious people who don't buy into divine command theory, but they might buy into this view, that God is a, a trustworthy friend here. And he understands what is just and righteous and compassionate and gives guidance about that. And you should pay attention. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's a, a, you know, Jesus is a good moral role model, for example. Like, what would Jesus do? You know, you can, if you're emulating that role model, that's, that's a pretty good way to go here. Even if you don't know everything on your own, you should do that. Now, even on this tack, you could be offering the argument that the opponent in Falk's article does, or you might accept Falk's position on this, and still that that's, doesn't necessarily mean a deal breaker for this kind of attitude toward God, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, <clears throat> this one is putting the emphasis on God's omniscience and good character, moral character, as the reason for deferring to God's judgment. And, and the objection is saying, do that as a replacement for human reason. So the recognition is like human reasons fallible, um, like maybe a, a Christian or um, a Muslim might say, like we're sinners, right? We are tarnished with unrighteousness and injustice. Or I could throw a little Buddhist thing on here too. It's like we have egos, and that corrupts, or it has a corrupting influence on our attempt to get at moral truth, or to figure out what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. I mean, this happens. I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying anything new here to you, to know that. There are ways that humans, in trying to do good, can screw it up <laughs> or get a distorted picture of justice, um, even when they're using their resources to the best of their ability sincerely. That even well-meaning attempts to get at what is morally right can, can go bad. You know, you can get dystopias, right? This kind of thing. So this opponent is saying it's because... We are not reliable to trust our own reason and rational capacities are not reliable and trustworthy sources of moral truth. There still is objective moral truth out there, and it's set independently of anyone say so, but God's the way to get access to it, to have access to that wisdom. So trust God, don't trust in yourself. That's the argument from the opponent. Falk now wants to reply to that. That that pretty clear now, like what this second version of the argument looks like? Can I repeat that last part? Uh, yes. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> um, so they're saying humans, uh, our, our epistemic access to moral truth is corrupted. <clears throat> it's not reliable. We are unreliable indicators, even when we're doing our best with the best that we've got to offer. We still screw it up. And it's because of those uh, observations on our own fallibility here is why we should be trusting to God instead of to our own judgment. Um, we don't know better. God does know better. And God's telling us what's up. So you should do that. Right? Don't try to figure it out for yourself. Trust in God's goodness and reliability as a moral indicator. And make your decisions based on what God's telling you to do, not what your own reason is telling you to do. And that premise, actually, about our fallibility is actually going to be one of the main sources of Falk's response to this objection and trying to, like, turn it on its head a little bit. Um, did, that, did that help, Bernadette? Was that the part you were wondering about? Okay, okay. How's everyone else doing? Good? Okay. All right, so let's go back to the text here, and I'll try to unpack it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but if it is said that if God says so, this should settle it, one may also mean something else. So here's the second argument in, in uh, Falk's words. That what should settle it <clears throat> is that it's God who says so, rather than God saying so. That the God saying so would be divine command theory, the first option. We just dealt with that. Um, so there's another way, that it's God that is the one that's saying so. And so God's a reliable indicator. For one will then be saying, 
If God is given the command, then one must take it that he's commanding the right thing, and it's reasonable to take one's instructions from a superior being, or someone who just has more moral authority. You probably do this with some humans you know, right? someone with maybe more experience or that you think is trustworthy, who has some more wisdom about things. Might, you might study philosophers for this reason. You'd be like, I, this person devoted their life to working on this sort of problem. I'm really interested in what they have to say. Their judgment might be better than my judgment, and so you defer to them. And this would be fair enough, Volk says. But again, this is not a view which could do in place of an ability on our part to arrive at rational convictions. So this is where I'm saying Falk's re reply is a little subtle. He's not saying you can't, you shouldn't be using God as an indicator of moral guidance. He's not against any kind of religiously informed ethical or moral perspective. What he's opposed to is relying on this as a replacement for rationality. Is saying that's why you know reason screwed up here that's why you shouldn't trust it we were t we told you so why do you think that reason was going to be able to solve moral perplexity this kind of thing human reason all right um for in the first place falk says it would presuppose that we can form these convictions trusting god and trusting to god's judgment presupposes an ability on our part falk is saying to form those convictions in the first place so he says we could not even conceive of God as telling what ultimate choices are right for us unless we knew what it was like to distinguish by ourselves between a right or a wrong choice. There's a very interesting uh, tangent here on um, interpreting Genesis and the Garden of Eden story, but I'm not going to open up that can of worms right now. Uh, true, uh, the tree of fruit of knowledge of good and evil. If you want to talk about that later with me sometime, we can do it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Falk is saying that being able to uh, appreciate or respect what God's recommendations are presupposes an ability on our own part to do this independently. We could not, uh, uh, so, so he says, um, so if skepticism of reason were correct, this view of how God would support us in our ultimate choices would fall to the ground too. And in, so that that's the first point. Um, it's kind of like saying if we didn't have uh, and we're capable of using in a productive, intelligible way our own rational faculties for making judgments about right and wrong, then God giving something like Ten Commandments or something, or any of the like insights, um, say through the Quran or something like that, all of that stuff uh, would just be unintelligible to us. It'd be like explaining um, calculus to someone who doesn't know anything about math. You just don't have the language for it. You don't have the capacity for it yet. Right, um, we wouldn't know what to do with what God is telling us to do. We wouldn't have a frame of reference to even know what to do with the advice. Kind of like Wittgenstein, actually. There's a fun connection here from the Wittgenstein thing of, um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't bring up Wittgenstein here because I don't know how deep into the reading everyone got because we only spent a little time with it. But um, Wittgenstein talks about what if you ask the question, uh, is this piece the king in like a chess set? And if, you, if someone said yes, or, or you're like, which piece is the king? And they point at one. For that to be intelligible, there actually has to be a, a context set for what you're going to do with the reply. Like whatever someone says when you ask the question, it's not going to be helpful or informative or insightful if you don't have something already established for what to do with their reply um, or, or know a way of interpreting it as being significant. And that's kind of like what Falk's saying here, too that it's our ability to reason about morality independently that makes it even possible for us to intelligibly, usefully, insightfully engage with what God is recommending or giving in the commands that God gives. Okay, and then he says in the second place, another reply here. God's support here could not replace independent thinking as, what, as much as one may hope, because the divine rulings tend to be general, as general, in fact, as the general enjoinders to doing well or dealing justly, like we were talking about earlier, which one thinks have a plain support and reason too. And like them, they still leave us without a sure guide when it comes to complex cases like Sartre's case, or to the problem like deciding on the right measure of liberty or social justice in the institution of a given society or the trade-off between security and freedom, things like this. Moreover, as the philosophers and divines, divines just means like theologians, of the 18th century, so much earlier time, used to stress. Without the recourse to right reason and independent moral thinking, there would be no check on the interpretations of the divine will by fallible human minds. 
So I mentioned before that in the like Enlightenment period, a lot of philosophers didn't see there being some kind of conflict here between the confidence in reason and participation with religious paradigms. Um, even that there was any conflict at all between science and religion. It's just it's not on the radar. And, and maybe not because they were missing something, <laughs> but maybe because they're an alternative way to frame what's going on here. Um, one, one little piece I can give you, um, a lot of theological pictures um, in the Middle Ages and, in, and then in the early modern period saw uh, reason as the way in which like the Bible talks about humans being made in God's image that uh, it's it's our rational capacities that puts us into like we're in the same we're the same ilk as god uh, it's just that we have fallible finite rational capacities and god has a perfect infinite um rational faculty um but we're we're playing the same game right even if there's some contrast there or asymmetry um we're playing the same game so i mentioned that this premise about human sinfulness or corruption or failure or finitude is going to be a major premise of Falk's reply to this religious argument. And what it, that's what he's doing here right at the end of what I just read to you, that um, he's saying on the premise that we can screw this stuff up, that's exactly why you need to have people being critical thinkers um, and doing independent reasoning, because if we're trying to follow what God's commands are, we first have to understand them. So if you imagine um, any kind of religious text, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, or anything else, right, that you have to take those words and figure out what they're saying. And you could misinterpret it. You could make mistakes about this. Um, but you're going to now, if you're making a mistake, you're going to kind of um, now put all the authority of God's command behind it and keep operating under that so what if you're if you're going to criticize such a person and they're like i don't need to listen to your human reason because i know god's will and so i'm going to obey god rather than obey you and just think of the kind of tragedies that can occur and have occurred in human history right is this making sense everyone yeah i i, I might be able to put the point sharply like this Falk's position is not that we can trust our judgment more than God's judgment, or that our wisdom is better than God's wisdom, or something that something blasphemous like this. He's saying the reason why you've got to critically engage and have independent reasoning about what your religion is telling you is God's will is not because of doubt about God or God's trustworthiness, but doubt about ourselves and our ability to understand or interpret it, to get it right to get the message that God's trying to convey to us. Um, that's the reason for emphasizing that religious faith or deference to God's commands could somehow be a substitute for rationality. And so just as a personal note here, this is this is the position I have as someone religious. Um, that, hey, that um, do I have faith in God's wisdom or you know God's ability to give insight or guidance for ethics and moral matters yeah but I don't think I don't have the arrogance of thinking I've got a perfect bead on what that is and so it's out of modesty that I have to engage very carefully with anything like scripture or doctrine or theology or something like that that there is independent thinking reasoning and debate that's required that has to be a part of that process not out of an arrogance about my own abilities but actually out of modesty for them as a kind of deference right um, okay so so much for the religious arguments um, people were interested in that uh, how did that go? How is this, uh, is this making sense? Did our, our treatment of this section satisfy? Any leftover bits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. And this kind of goes for anything. Whether, I mean, there's, there are secular versions of divine command theory that are possible here too. Uh, or, or like I was, um, mentioning oh no 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 that was in my last lecture i was having a discussion with one of my old grad school buddies yesterday uh catching up after i'm not talking in a while and we were remarking about we, we had a similar observation of how some um elements of, of progressive like left po politic and and views of social justice which we both sympathize with and we're a big lefty um 
are have sort of taken a turn of being against critical thinking or against rational discourse as part of like a backlash to some elements of like uh, more conservative or right wing perspectives that have tried to lay claim to the to the label of critical thinking. Like uh, I've noticed this a lot with libertarian culture, um, but that would be like suicide, <laughs> right? To, to put your stock in some arbitrary uh, source of authority about what's morally right and wrong that's not willing to engage critically with itself. Um, that seems really like dangerous uh, for the same reasons that Falk is saying here about uh, religious authority. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, we've got 10 minutes left here, and I do want to get to this last section where we get Falk's own perspective. So let me try to give you a kind of quick summary of what Falk has got going on here. There are two big things that he wants to positively argue for about rationality and rationality's reason's role in being able to resolve uh, moral perplexity, moral disagreement, moral controversy, um, and, and why we should be optimistic and, and keep using it. Basically, stay the course on this from the Enlightenment, so to speak, maybe with some updates because times are changing and they have different moral problems, all that stuff we talked about before, but that we shouldn't be losing um, confidence in applying the tools of rationality to grapple with these questions and grapple with these issues. Okay. So the first thing, the first big claim kind of gets captured in this quote right here. The crucial question remains that of skepticism of reason. We must ask, how far is it really justified? Skepticism, Falk says, often comes from the disappointment of misplaced expectations. I love that phrase. It's a really great turn of phrase for capturing this point. So speaking in this voice, he says, there is no comfort in anything because nothing is good enough to replace the lost hope. And Sartre's view illustrates this. He finds that there's no sure way of choosing between one's mother and one's country. So he concludes that there can be no way of choosing anything rather than anything else. But this is precisely what does not follow. And the truth as I see it is rather that the power of thought to guide ultimate choices is a matter of degree. So the first, the first major point Falk's going to be pushing for here is that in evaluating whether reason is worthy of our participation or as the tool that we're going to use to go after moral perplexity, moral disagreements, and to make choices in life, is, uh, needs to be set with the proper expectations. It's not going to solve everything in a crystal clear black and white way. But he's sort of saying it's better to be doing that than not doing that. So I like this quote right here. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. One has not got enough ground here for saying that only one choice and no other could be right for everyone who is properly human. But nor could one say that every natural basis for a better or worse choice has gone. One may still make these choices judicial. Okay, uh, I, got, I think I bought us a little bit more time here, so I'll try to finish this up quick. Okay, so he's, uh, the quote I was reading. One may still make these choices judiciously or not, be guided in them by impartial reflection and honest self-scrutiny, or follow one's blind leanings. For these are qualities of mind on which judiciousness and choice depend at all times. In hard cases, they cannot be exercised easily. But this is not enough for saying with Sartre that there is no guide in them at all. If there is not always a choice which is the one that is properly human, there is always a properly human way of making one's choices. So another big way to put Falk's first kind of thesis here is that instead of holding reason's legitimacy as a guide for solving moral problems accountable to a standard that evaluates its answers, the products of it, so of saying, like, all the moral theories that reason has given us so far have not fully resolved our moral perplexity, therefore it's bullshit. He's saying that's the wrong standard to be evaluating it by. It's not about the product, it's about the process. He's saying the legitimacy of using reason as a way to make ethical decisions or to form your values is not about that it's able to give you all the answers, but rather that it's the best way of proceeding. You're going to make choices no matter what. And is it good to do it carefully, critically, reflectively, in dialogue with others, exposed to diverse options, thinking about the opponent charitably, like doing all that stuff that's on the intellectual code of conduct that we had from the beginning of the quarter, or not do that, 
right? Use some other way of making decisions that maybe is more arbitrary or based on whim, that isn't self-critical, that isn't looking to engage with diverse perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's saying, even if I'm not sure that any particular answer that moral philosophy has ever provided is the answer that settles everything, I'm still like approaching morality in a philosophical way is clearly the right thing to do. Okay, so he's shifting the evaluative metric. He uh, He's shifting the goalposts, but not in a way that's like bad or objectionable. I mean, this might just be putting them in the right place. Like he said, skepticism often comes from the disappointment of misplaced expectations. And he's saying the way that people who are skeptical of reason are evaluating it are using the wrong standards. They have misplaced expectations of what we should expect from reason. Okay, so that's one that's one half of, of Falk's position. The second half of his position is saying that reason, effectively, reason is a lot more than people generally treat it as being. So um, I'll, I'll find out. I got a good quote for this. Um, he says, we keep confusing ourselves when we call this the way of reason, and this confusion accounts for much of our disorientation. The point is not that the right choice may not be called the one guided by reason, but that reason can mean so many things. Reason makes one think of calculation, of deduction, of learning from experience. But the reason which can guide ultimate choices, moral and ethical choices, is none of these, um, or at least not exclusively. That, and one draws attention to this when one says that the good need not be the clever, which I think, um, I can't remember who that quote is originally from, but it's a fantastic quote. The good need not be the clever. Um, Williams kind of shares a similar view in that introduction to morality that we read uh, for him last week, um, where he's saying, like, uh, theoretical sophistication may not be the sign of, like, moral truth. Um, and, yeah, so it's not necessarily you need to be going to the philosophers to get guidance about this stuff. Now, it also might require that, because it might be that morality is very complicated, and so there is going to be a lot of a theoretical rigor that's required. That's my kind of personal view. But there still is, it's still worth acknowledging here that what you're doing when you're doing rational, critical thinking is not just a purely analytical, logic-crunching, calculation type of activity. Um, let's keep going. Um, do, 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 do. And yet one may say, if loosely, uh, okay, okay, because using reason may also mean reminding oneself of what one knows already. So sometimes reasoning just means I figured something out before, I just need to remember it, right? I need to apply it to this particular case, um, like learning from history, for example. Putting it to oneself clearly, vividly, and without reserve. So another another part of reasoning is taking maybe something you're already familiar with, but making it breathe, like applying it in a way where you have an honest contact with it, rather than just being like, yeah, 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 I know I'm supposed to do good to people or something, right, in a dismissive sort of way that doesn't take the full scope or gravity of what that really means. Like having a moral principle or value that you don't really think about is all of its implications or how deep it is. That You might have it, you've got the concept right in front of you, but it's like how tightly or how closely do you understand what it means to accept that. Um, and the properly human choice is one which is directed by such reminders. Um, he talks about some other things here. I really love this quote where he says, uh, um, one may know of 3,000 flood victims, or maybe victims of, say, coronavirus, put it in a more contemporary context, maybe that's too real, um, we may know of a huge number of victims and feel no compunction to help because, as Arthur Kostler once said, statistics don't bleed. I love that. That's a great quote right there. But then Falk, I love this other quote from Falk following up on it. He says, and one might add, yeah, statistics don't bleed unless one makes them bleed. And that kind of empathetic moral imagination, he wants to say, is also in the wheelhouse of what it means to be using reason or moral reasoning, um, and a bunch of other things too. So bottom line, I ran out of space again. Uh, I fixed it back here. Before it, we run out of time, I mean, we'll run this to the very end here, but I want to give you the, the second half of the C-O-D-E. Um, so that is going to be humanity. So that's the name of this board game that I, I got that I'm excited to play next week. Um, so you put the one from earlier together with this one, 
put that into the quiz on Canvas, that's how you get your attendance credit. Okay, so you'll need both halves. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, boom, boom. Just put them together. It's a really cool topic of philosophy and speculative future stuff, uh, futurism. Um, you put those together, and there's a whole awesome board game about it. Anyway. I want to read one last quote before I run out of hard di disk space because we, we basically got the two ideas down. One, rationality is a process and it should be evaluated that way for its legitimacy rather than for its products. Second idea, the process of rationality is something more robust than sometimes we give it credit for. So it might be like, of course reason fails if you're thinking reason's only capable of doing this. But if it can do this, it's a lot more. As he puts in another quote here, you test moral questions and approaching them with moral reasoning or using rationality here tests your whole self against the problem for action for the choice of what to do okay um yeah 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 okay you got that okay cool so here's here's a, here's a really fun quote right from the end of the article i said before that skepticism comes from the disappointment of misplaced expectations and skeptical disorientation will remain a sign of our time until we have learned to accept moral thinking for what it is and with its limits. What everyone hopes for as a guide, this is a really, this is a great like slogan for the, the hope and optimism of moral theory, uh, which I engage in. I, this is my area of specialization. I've been working on my own moral theory, and this is the, the goal I want to shoot for, kind of like Wittgenstein's preface, where he's like, I wanted to write a good book. It didn't do that, but it would have looked like this. So it's, he says, what everyone hopes for as a guide are rules by which to settle all cases applicable with ease and in the same way to everyone alike. Basically, it has the power to answer all moral questions in a way that is not question begging, that isn't, uh, doesn't have double standards, there's no exception cases, you know, there's no counter examples that, it, that could be the basis of, of objecting to that theory. Um, it's doing everything, it's covering everything. Um, and it's applicable with ease, it's elegant, it doesn't require a massive amount of calculation to make a decision. Instead, he says, what we have available is a procedure, calling on many and fallible qualities of mind. A procedure which yields some broad and fairly obvious answers, but which for the rest leaves us to puzzle things out for ourselves, with a margin for error and disagreement too wide for comfort. He's like, I know it's tough, it doesn't feel good, we don't get everything you want. He says, 